Thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is Dr. Taylor Clem with UF IFAS Extension in Alachua County. And uh, today for our monthly Master Gardener Volunteer Lecture Series program, uh, we're gonna be talking all about vermicomposting. And uh, our Master Gardener that we have presented today is actually one of our interns, but is a, uh, but is very passionate and very interested in talking about vermicomposting is doing this a lot at his home. So um, we know that he'd be an excellent presenter for today's program. Um, and just kind of let everybody know that we are gonna be recording this and we will follow up with a, a copy of the presentation as well as some additional resources from the University of Florida IFAS Extension. Uh, just in case it's like, you know, you wanna learn and learn a bit, a little bit more about the topic, make sure that we get that to you. Um, and we do put everything onto our YouTube channel. Um, we do have a YouTube page and I'll send it out to you all because that's where you can get a recording of this um, and access it at a later date. So I want to thank uh, Joe very much uh, for taking his time and putting this program together uh, for us today. And again, throughout the presentation, feel free to put any of your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and myself and the other Master Gardener volunteers that are here, we're going to help monitor those and help answer those questions. So Joe, thank you very much and we appreciate you taking the time and joining us today. All right, thank you Dr. Clem. Um, as Dr. Clem said, I am a class of 2020, so I'm a brand new Master Gardener. I'm an intern still. Um, give, give you a little bit of my, about my background. Uh, I spent 22 years in the Navy. Uh, I, I was uh, injured during Desert Storm, non-combat injury, fortunately, uh, and ultimately it led to me becoming disabled, and I had to find something to do. <laughs> I always did like gardening, uh, and so I threw myself full, full force into gardening, and then I discovered this, this Master Gardener program, and it just called my name. So I, I applied, was accepted. And I actually did this vermicomposting presentation as part of my, uh, my, as my project for the Master Gardener class. So what is vermicomposting? So vermicomposting is using worms. It's using, it's, not, it's composting we know is where we take organic material and we work it and, you know, some people do it in a bin, some people do it on the ground, but it's to work it, to turn it and break it down into an organic fertilizer. Well, vermicomposting is using worms to do the same thing. And what you're doing is you're taking your kitchen, your kitchen waste, your garden waste, and you're feeding it to your worms. Now, when I say earthworms is a generic term, that's because there's over 9,000 different species of earthworms, and not all earthworms are good for composting. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the different types of earthworms later, which ones are good for composting, which ones are not. So sit back, relax as we go through these 9,000 species. <laughs> um, we're gonna focus, like I said, on vermicomposting, uh, which is again, it's using earthworms to create an organic fertilizer. And by the end of the presentation, you'll have a better understanding of exactly what the benefits of vermicomposting is. Um, the different types, as I already mentioned, of composting worms and the ones that aren't suited for composting. Uh, what life is like for your best friend, which is the most common uh, composting worm, is the red wiggler. And there's a couple of different types of worm farms also. There's uh, two types of closed worm farms, but you also have an open worm farm, which some people, I don't know if you've seen, where they, do, they use the, their garden as a, as a composting site also. The two types are an, a horizontal or just a flat single bin system. And the other type of worm farm is a vertical system where you're stacking bins one on top of each other. Uh, we're going to talk about maintaining the health of your worm farm, uh, how to feed your worms, what you can give them, what you shouldn't give them. Um, again, the vertical worm farm is bins on top of each other. So we're going to talk about how to add a bin to a vertical worm farm. And I'm also going to talk about how to harvest those valuable worm castings. We call it black gold, but they're, they're really a dark brown, but they look black. We call it black gold. It's a very, very good organic fertilizer. Now, although it's not a 10, 10, 10, as far as, you know, the primary nutrients of NPK, it's still got a very good uh, nutritious value for your plants and your vegetables. And then we're going to also talk about troubleshooting because with anything that you do, you're going to run into problems once in a while. And this, 
troubleshooting will teach you different ways to resolve those problems. Um, please bear with me with the errs and the ums. I haven't done a presentation in a while. So this is my first, you guys that are listening, you're uh, kind of like my, my, trial, my trial audience. <laughs> Um, before we go on to move, uh, talking about choosing your worm farm, whether you want to use a single bin system or a vertical system, let's talk about some of the benefits of vermicomposting. Vermicomposting is raising worms to collect their waste, their poop. Worm castings is just a fancy term for worm poop, but it's a great organic fertilizer. It's nearly odorless. Um, when you're handling it, you don't even know you're hand handling poop. Um, it looks just like soil. And it helps your plants produce a more nutritious product. Or if you're raising uh, flowers, uh, a much brighter flowers, nicer flowers. Um, worms have these microorganisms within their bodies that um, when they eat the food and mixes with these microorganisms, and then they release their worm castings. Those worm castings also help plants resist disease and also some pests. Uh, it's just, it's something in those microorganisms that the, the plants can read. It's very, very interesting. I'm not gonna go into the science of how all that works, but it's, it's really nice to know when you're using an organic fertilizer such as worm castings, you're, you're protecting your plants as well as feeding your plants. And also by raising your uh, worms and uh, getting worm castings, you're, you're keeping uh, kitchen waste and garden waste out of the landfills. We're minimizing what goes to the landfills. Deciding on the worms. I think I put this backwards because we probably want to decide on the type of worm farm we want to use first, but we can, we can walk through this first. Um, as I said, you're going to want to determine the type of worm you're going to want to use for your for your composting. I'm going to quit saying vermicomposting. We all understand. I think I'm talking about worm farms and, and raising them for their waste. Um, most of us think all earthworms are alike. And like I said, there's 9,000 species, but most of us would be wrong. And I, I know I was wrong. Um, I've seen earthworms and I thought this is the same thing. It's just a smaller version of the older ver older one. But no, there, there, there's a lot of different earthworms. Um, but again, oh, there's only three types that we use out of about 9,000. There's three worms that are really, really well suited for, worm, for composting uh, in your worm farm. The king and queens are the red wigglers of the composters. And why the reason they are is because they are voracious eaters. They can consume one half of their body weight daily in food. Next up is just as voracious eater is the African night. Uh, crawlers, but the problem with them is they can't handle environmental changes as easily as the red wigglers do. Uh, they, they have a very uh, big sensitivity to temp cold temperatures. Um, maybe that's why they're <laughs> from Africa. Um, European night crawlers, they're also good composters, but they don't eat as much as the red wiggler or the African uh, night crawler. So those are your three composting worms and the reason they're good is because they don't live deep in the ground like a lot of your other worms they live these are more surface dwellers and they'll they usually live in the top four to six inches of, of the uh, of the earth um deciding on the worms canadian night crawlers we don't want to use those those are really in the anti-composting category um they would set the standard for what worms not to use. Um, they're deep diggers. Like I said, most worms live deep in the earth. They don't swarm food. They just eat it as they see it. Um, and they're not very fast at reproducing. So if you start with 500 Canadian night crawlers in a year, you're probably still going to have 500 Canadian night crawlers. Whereas with red wigglers, they multiply very quickly. They're also difficult to maintain because again, they're deep, uh, they're deep dwellers. These are the ones that you normally see people using for bait when they go fishing. Um, and the other one is the Alabama jumper. This is one that's become common to our area and much of the United States. They're an invasive species of worm. And unfortunately, they're decimating the local earthworm population. Uh, they're, they're actually, they prefer leaf litter and which most, a lot of our worms like that also. 
So what they're doing is they're eating it faster than our worms can get to it. So the Alabama jumper is actually taking over. Um, easy to identify if you ever see a big fat worm and you pick it up and it starts jumping all over the place. And it's got a little bit of blue in it. Good chance you're holding an Alabama jumper. Attempting to use either of these earthworms is um, not productive. It's simply cruel because again, they, they just don't do well in captivity and they would most likely all try to escape. And if they escape, they're gonna end up on dry ground and end up dying. So again, let's stick, to, we wanna to stick to red wigglers, European night crawlers and African night crawlers. All right, let's talk a little bit about the life of, excuse me, the life of a red wiggler. This is your best friend when it comes to composting. Um, so in order for you and your, your worms to work together in harmony, you need to know a little bit about them because if you don't know about your worms, you're not gonna know what to feed them, how to treat them and what, uh, what environments to keep them in. We're not talking about just any old earthworm either. What we're talking about is the absolute best composting worm around, Isenia fotida, or fotida, fotida. Hey Joe, <laughs> I had a, a question yeah. I wanted to ask you. Yeah, um, so one was, I know we get a lot of calls, you may address this already, so you can just say I'm gonna talk about this later, Taylor, but um, okay. we get a lot of calls in our office of people that are interested in doing vermicomposting. Um, right. And you're mentioning some of these good earthworms that we can use like the red wigglers um yeah. where where do we get where do we get these worms if we want to start doing uh vermicomposting like a bait shop or are there other places that no. like online shops that you would recommend not necessarily recommend but yeah, how I won't, you source I them? Any, yeah i can't recommend any places but yeah there are places you can get them online um i wouldn't buy them in bait shops chances are if you get them Worms and bait shops, you're getting uh, probably uh, Canadian night crawlers mm -hmm. or some of these Alabama jumpers. They're, they're, they're more useful for fishing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can go online and just search red wiggler and they're, they're not cheap. And that's another reason you want to make sure you <laughs> take good care of them. They're, they're, they're expensive, but they do multiply quickly. So you only have to buy them once if you're taking good care of them. Yeah, um, yeah. I've been running my current farm for about nine months now and i'm on my i do a vertical farm i'm on my i'm on my third bin so i've got two full bins now of earthworm of, of worm castings oh wow it's not a very it's not a super fast process but and i'll get into this a little bit later but when you are using earthworm castings for your garden you only want like for me i will add them to my garden right before the gardening season starts so in the spring in my raised garden beds, I mix in uh, all of my earthworm castings. Oh, and that nice. pretty much sustains my gardens throughout the, the summer, or spring and summer. Oh, that, that so kind of relates. Online. And that relates to kind of a question someone mentioned is the, can you use it as your primary nutrient source? And I said, it's a great amendment, but still always be on the lookout for nutrient deficiencies. But, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Um, and then the other question I wanted to ask and I think I think one thing that popped up. So sorry, I'm derailing you like right off the bat. No, no, not at all. Not at all. <laughs> um, is You're actually helping me get into the the, the rhythm. Getting of in it. the groove. Oh, yeah, red wigglers. I do not think they're native to Florida. They are flavored no. native to Europe, but they're not non-invasive like the Alabama jumpers and. Correct. That, okay. Thank you. That was Correct. that was the but question I had. That's mm -hmm. a good. That's a good point you raise, and I don't think I have this in my presentation. You don't really want to use red wigglers in Florida in your outside garden as a, as a, it's called an open vermicomposting. I don't know if people have seen those bins that they saw you put in your garden and they got holes in them. And the worms can go back and forth into your garden and back into mm. the composting bin where you feed them. But the temperatures are just too high and because they live toward, towards the surface, they just wouldn't do well. Um, if you really want a way to get good worms to your garden is put, uh, what I did is I, at the end of Halloween, I took a bunch of, I got all my neighbor's pumpkins, cut them up and spread them through my garden. And that will draw worms in very quick. Mm -hmm. um, so, but I wouldn't use, you're right, they're not native to Florida. They would not do well if you, if you release them into the wild, they probably wouldn't survive. Oops, how do I go back through this? 
Uh, so yeah, that's a good point. That's Thank very you, good Joe. Point. I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, like I said, we're not talking about anal worm. We're just talking about the red wiggler, which I'm going to call uh, wiggler for short, not to confuse with the Alabama jumper, which are jumpers. Um, the rig wigglers do very, very well in close, highly populated conditions, and they can actually control their environment. Um, like I said, you'd never find these wigglers deep in, heading deep underground. They're more of a surface dweller. And they can also withstand a very wide range of temperatures and environmental conditions that most other earthworms couldn't handle. Your other earthworms, that's why they're deep dwellers. They dwell down in the earth so they can get away from the cold and, or the hot or the different environments. Now, the red wigglers are actually a kind of a small worm. They're only about five inches in length. And they're not really fat worms like you'd see in a, in a night crawler. Um, but even at their size, they eat a lot of food. They'll eat as much as a half of their weight daily. And then they're, they're just basically, I put worm casting machines because that's what they do. They eat and poop, eat and poop all day long. And they eat more than just, well, we'll talk about this some more. They eat more than just the um, kitchen waste and garden waste. There's, there's much more to their diet than that. Um, they're prolific breeders. Like I said, they'll, they'll set their environment. Uh, they are mature approximately nine weeks after birth. That means if you buy them from a, a source online, the youngest wiggler in your purchase is going to be breeding in about two and a half months. So that's, you can tell, is very, very quick. They don't give live birth and they don't lay eggs. Hmm. People wonder, well, then how are the worms born? A lot of people are familiar uh, with, I don't know if you can see my arrow moving here, the clitellum on an earth, on a worm. That's that round piece that's raised up on a worm. It's kind of, it looks like a swollen band or a ring. That's called the clitellum. And that's where all of the um, action takes place when it comes to mating. They are asexual, but they still need a mate to have babies. So what they'll do is that when they mate, they both exchange sperm to each other. And then what happens is that clitellum, it begins to form a mucus ring. And then that's that worm you normally see around the worm's body. And then what happens when they're finished mating, the clitellum or the mucus ring will start to dry out. And then the worm will actually back out of it. And as the worm's backing out of it, the, the ring, the seminal fluid and the, and the ovum and amniotic fluid are all drawn into this little capsule. And you can see in the picture, it creates what's known as a cocoon. You've probably seen these in the wild and didn't know what they were. They're, they're, they actually do. They're little green. They look like little green marbles or peas. And each one holds about five worms, but normally about only three survive. Uh, as I said, they're prolific breeders, so if you purchase one pound of red wigglers, which is about 500 worms, your colony is going to double about every four months. But again, I said they adapt to their environment, and what that means is they will only have enough offspring that the environment can hold. So if you have a bin that's, say, one foot by one foot wide around a square and it's five inches deep, you're only going to have as many wigglers as they decide they can fit in their environment. They know when to stop breeding. They know when they're getting too crowded. Um, of course, many factors influence their breeding, temperature, the moisture of their bedding, the pH, the food you feed them. All of that has an effect on their colony size. Um, if you notice your colony shrinking, and I'll get into that in troubleshooting, then you know you have a problem. But they will self-regulate their own environment and their, their numbers. Okay, so now we've talked about the, the worms you want to use. And the same, the, the same with the um, African night crawlers and European night crawlers. They are not as prolific breeders, but they also will regulate the number of worms in their uh, environment also. Uh oh, timed out here. Okay, am I back on, Dr. Klein? Yeah, you're good. Okay, my apologies. I don't know why that popped up. And uh, no worries. Um, now let's talk about the farms. I, I mentioned there's the single bin system, as you see down in the right hand corner. That's the, that's not actually a worm farm. It's just to give you an idea of what you could use. 
there's no holes in it for the the worms to breathe through. So you you'd have to set that bin up. But that's that's a single container system for raising uh, your your worms to get your worm castings. The pros of that is it offers an overall larger surface area for your worms to live and work in. So you can put a lot more worms in a single container system if it's about that size than you could in a vertical farm. A vertical farm is designed to save space. So most of them are not more than 15 inches uh, in, in a square. Um, so again, you can fit more worms than you can in the vertical farm. Um, problem with it, a con, is it takes up a lot of space. Those are good sized containers. They're probably about 18 inches wide by oh, two and a half feet long by just about a foot, foot and a half tall. So they do take up a lot of space. Uh, and they're a little bit more difficult to, to harvest your worm castings. Not, to, not, not knocking them, they are good worm farms, but you, you just have to decide what works best for you in your, in your home. Down in the right hand corner, uh, if anyone's been involved in worm farming, this is your typical vertical farm. You could make your own probably if you can find some bins to insert into each other size wise and, and they're out there. Uh, but a lot of people will just buy these on the internet. They're called um, just vertical worm farms or vermicomposting farms. This is what I like to use because I don't have a lot of space. So this is a single system. And I actually, the, since they're odorless, I, I've actually kept it in my house. You don't smell them. There's no leakage issues. You don't get worms crawling out and crawling through your house. So this is a good, a really good system, um, especially if you're trying to save space. Like I said, I use this little ground area. And also it's very easy to harvest the castings from this particular farm. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, on the previous one, it's do you, if you use a horizontal farm, what size bin should you use? Or does it really matter? Is, you know, using something like that tote as a scale, is that appropriate? Yeah, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Just something at least that you can fit is about four or five inches deep for the, for the area for the worms in. And then you want to make have at least another foot above that in height for the worms as they create the worm castings to fill it up. If you just have a bin that's four or five inches deep, well, you're not going to ever get any worm castings because that's the surface area they normally live in. It's going to all spill out. So you want something that's at least, that's a good good question, Dr. Pun, thank you. Thank you. You want something that is at least 12 inches, if not 18 inches tall, if you're gonna use a horizontal. Perfect. That's thank a really good question. I didn't think about, I'm gonna add that in there, thank you. Oh, no worries. Great. I'm still here. <laughs> um, add size. Okay, so getting back to the vertical farm. Again, it's very easy to harvest the castings from these uh, these worm farms. Uh, there's a, an issue going around. I don't know if you, if you can see in that picture, there's, there's a little cup under that. And if anyone's involved in vermicomposting right now and uses one of these farms, that little cup is to catch any of the excess liquid that, fall, that, that drains down if the worm bin gets too, if the farm gets too moist or too wet, that's how you can drain out the excess water. It'll go down into a holding area there. It's called leachate. Don't use it. It's full of bacteria and other things. There's been discussions back and forth about using it because it's it's got good nutrition in it because it's coming from the worms. No, don't use it. So if you're already using a worm farm of this nature and people have told you to use the, the excess water that comes out on your, on your garden, don't. Especially in your, your garden where you've got vegetables growing because there's, you know, no, telling what bacteria may be in that, that excess moisture that's leached off. Um, and that's still an ongoing discussion. So right now, most worm farmers are just saying, just, just stay away from it. They may change later um, once they do more chemical testing of some of these people send their samples in. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to change directions there. Vertical worm farms are the cons. They limit the number of worms. Again, I, like I said, uh, most of these vertical farms are about 15 inches by 15 inches. And you can see they're about mm, four or five inches deep. When And I'll talk about the bedding. When you start your bedding, you're only going to start with about an inch and a half of bedding in here. 
Um, because it regulates the number of worms there's gonna, they're gonna have in there, it's gonna limit the speed at which you get your worm castings. So those are the two cons with that. I'm a fan of it. I haven't actually tried the other farm, so I can't tell you the difference if I would like the other one better or not. Um, I did have a video, which I'm obviously not gonna show, show here, I'll walk you through the folks through this, but um, I have videos online about how to set up bedding for worm farms and how to feed your, your worms and how to harvest the worms. Um, but that's at a uh, business site, so I don't didn't want to share that because I don't want to um, recommend one over another. I don't want to get into recommending particular worm farms. So when you set up your bedding for your worm farm, a lot of folks like to use this Compressed, this compressed coconut core. It's not a soil, it's basically the husks all ground down of coconut and compressed into a giant, into a block. And when you get it wet, it expands uh, into quite, I think about two cubic foot if you get the standard block of, of coconut soil. Soil for lack of better word, of coconut core. Some people in, in lieu of the coconut core, they'll use peat moss. Um, and then shredded newspaper, black ink only, shredded plain, plain white paper, shredded cardboard, um, crust eggshells. That's really just very little. You, you'll be feeding your worm eggshells as you raise your worms. Dry leaves and dry grass. Um, and then you want to have a four or five gallon container to uh, work with your coconut core. So setting up the bedding, what you're going to do is you're going to place your coconut core into a bucket or into a wheelbarrow, whatever you choose. Fill the bucket with four or five cups of warm water. What that do, it does is it helps to speed up that, that block in breaking down. You're going to need more than four or five cups. It just really gets it started. Uh, and you're going to want to work the water through that, that coconut core block, breaking it down into its fibers, add more water as necessary. And then the goal is you want to get it all broken down and then you want it just wet enough whereas if you take a handful and you squeeze it, you only get like one or two drops of water out of it. You don't want it wet, you want it moist. Um, I, I kind of like to use the, because um, I'm from Michigan, uh, like a snowball, when you squeeze it, it holds together, you let it go, it holds its, its shape but only a drop or two of water will come out. Same thing will happen with a snowball because you're heating it up and only a drop or two of water will fall out. If you get the coconut core too wet, then that's where your shredded newspaper or cardboard or leaves or, or grass comes in. You can add some of that to help soak up the excess moisture. Don't use green leaves, don't use green grass. What that will do is it's a, it causes, it'll cause uh, chemical reaction with the rest of the bedding because you're gonna have your browns in there and your greens in there. So like with regular composting, the reason you put greens and browns is to heat up your compost and that helps uh, create a chemical reaction to break down your materials in your compost bin. You don't wanna create that same heat in your vermicomposting bin because what it'll do, it will kill your worms. So that's definitely uh, something you want to avoid. They're, ex like I said, they're expensive. Okay, let's see where we're at here. I'm sorry about this. Okay. So yeah, once you get the bedding all into the right consistency, you're gonna add it to your, well, if it's too wet, like I said, add dry, dry shirt newspaper. Do a little bit at a time until you get the desired consistency. Uh, you don't want to be going back and forth, getting it too dry, and then have to add water, then it's too wet. So just a little bit at a time. Uh, and if it's too dry, add a little bit of water. Again, a little bit at a time until you get that same desired consistency. When you add your bedding to the worm farm, it does not matter if you're using a horizontal farm or a vertical farm. You're going to add it to the bottom of your worm farm. Again, making sure it's moist, not wet. But before you do that, you want to put a couple of sheets of dry newspaper or a piece of cardboard at the bottom. What that's going to do is it's going to help 
soak up any excess uh, moisture, but it's also going to keep your worms from crawling out of the bottom. <laughs> you don't want them crawling out of the bottom of your worm bin. I forgot to mention, you're going to want it when you create your horizontal bin or your single bin system, you're going to want to drill like half inch holes throughout the bottom. That's so that you can let the excess moisture drain out. Um, because when you feed them, it's going to create moisture. A lot of people will feed them, they'll freeze their excess kitchen scraps until they get a whole bunch and then they'll place like little ice cubes of kitchen scraps in the worm bin. So what that does is it, it, it Cause, it can cause some excess moisture. So that's what the holes in the bottom are for. And then you're gonna add about an inch to an inch and a half of the, the, the bedding you just made to the base of your worm farm. Then come your worm. Uh, hopefully you've already ordered your worms and before you set up your bedding, or you, because you want to make sure that the bedding's moist. If you set it up a week beforehand, you're gonna have to get your bedding all moist again. So. Yeah, don't set up your bedding until you have your worms. So what you'll do is you'll add the worms with the the bedding they came in to the worm to to the worm farm you just started. Now what you're going to do is you're going to want to get a couple sheets of newspaper and get them a little moist and lay that on top of the bedding. That's just to they like it dark. Worms like darkness. So when you open and take the lid off of it, it's not going to stress them and send them barrel into the bottom of your worm farm, they have the newspaper covering it. Hey, uh, Joe. So first, yes, sir. Will that, do you ever have to replace that newspaper? Because I imagine it just uh, breaks On down. the top? Does it break down and, and they end up being able to escape or? They don't normally escape. They don't normally escape through the top. They don't normally escape if you set it up properly. Like the, the single bin, if you drill the holes in the bottom, you're going to set that bin into another like a a box or something so that if they do somehow get out out of the bottom if that cardboard in the bottom breaks down because you're right it's going to break down they may crawl out but if the conditions are right my worms don't crawl out of my farm they stay in the farm they they, they know there's food there so they stay there um and how but, close do you put those holes that you do you drill those holes oh probably about every six inches Okay, so it's not like you don't a need crazy a bunch. It's just of enough, okay. Yeah, just enough for the water to drain out. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. We're getting a lot of questions about these little detail things, but we'll probably that's save perfect. some for the end, but that's totally fine. That's perfect. Yeah. That's perfect. Yeah, and, and again, I, I'd i like to get those questions. Uh, you'll get, you're will going to give those to me, Dr. Plum, right? So I can incorporate yeah. that into the presentation for future yep. presentations. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Um, your worms, when you get them, they're going to be stressed. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to leave the lid off for a couple of days. Three to four days is okay. Um, you can leave the, leave the paper on top because if they do crawl along the side, I'm sorry, I'm doing all these hand motions. <laughs> if, the, if, if the worms do crawl along the side of the newspaper and get on top of the nurse newspaper, that's okay. They're going to crawl right back down because you're going to have the lid off and they don't like the light. Um, for nighttime, you want to either place a light over the top of your worm farm or keep it in your garage where it's going to, you can keep the light on at night. Um, and you don't want to feed your worms the first couple of days. There's plenty of food from what you put in your bedding. They, they actually do eat the shredded newspaper. They eat the shredded cardboard. Worms, believe it or not, have mouths. People don't, didn't, I didn't know that when I got started on this. They don't have teeth to chew, but they do have mouths. So they kind of like suck the, the food in and then it breaks down. So yeah, they, you don't need to feed them the first couple of days you have them. They're gonna have plenty, um, plenty to eat. Once you've had your worm farm up and going for a couple of days, you can decide where you wanna put it either inside or outside. Um, I learned this the hard way. If you're gonna place it outside, you're gonna wanna put it into a uh, a box or a bin that's bigger than it and spread diatomaceous earth around the base of your bin. The reason being is if red ants or even regular ants get in there, they will decimate your worm farm. I was gone for a week from my worm farm because you don't have to feed them every day. You can, they'll, they'll be fine normally for a week. And I didn't know this issue with the ants. When I came home, I opened it up and it was full of fire ants and, and eggs. 
no worms were left. They were all dead. I think, I don't know if they ate them, what they did, but there was no worms left. So in Florida here, if you're going to keep your bin outside, make sure you keep it in a, keep your bin in another container that you can put diatomaceous earth around it. The way diatomaceous earth works, it's an old, uh, it's basically ground up old fossils. And because insects are, they have exoskeletons, they wear their skeleton on the outside. If they try to crawl through this diatomaceous earth, it will cut them up and it kills them. So they won't cross it. So that's your defense against worms. Um, mice, I can't really say, <laughs> I haven't solved that problem yet. If they get the lid off, they can get into your farm. I had my farm in my garage and I was, um, I took the lid off because it was getting a little warm and a mouse got in my garage and I found that it dug into it and ate some of my worms. Didn't get all of them, but so yeah, there's a, you know, animal, in, nature's nature. You have to do, be willing to deal with nature if you're going to be involved in vermicomposting. You're not going to have a mouse problem if you keep the lid on. That was my fault. Um, but I can't emphasize enough about the ants. You need to make sure that if you're going to have your bin outside or even in your garage, put it into another container that you can put diatomaceous earth around it. So there, you now have a working farm. You have your farm set up, your worms are in there and uh they, they they've had them for a couple days and they're going to start doing what you got them for so now what do you do you have your farm set up doesn't matter what type of worm farm you're using a horizontal worm farm a single system or if you're using a vertical this is where the work begins and you need to start caring for and managing your farm uh the wigglers are very easy to care for like I said, you can ignore them most of the times. I go in on vacation for a week or so. In two weeks, you could even do it. You don't need a worm sitter. You don't need to take them to a friend's house and say, can you watch my worms? <laughs> I'd like to see the look on their face when you say, can you watch my worms? I'm raising worms. Um, in the gardening world, that's not out of the ordinary. <laughs> no, I understand that, right? <laughs> Um, the three things that you're going to need to keep an eye on is pH, moisture, and temperature. Just like with your plants, pH, moisture, and temperature. Um, I think that's pretty standard for all living things. I don't know about people and pH, but I think moisture and temperature make a big difference for us. Um, so those are the three, th three things you want to keep an eye on. The um, moisture, all worms breathe through oxygen through their skin. They absorb it. So that's why the bedding needs to be moist. And usually around 80% moisture level is good. You can buy a moisture meter at most, at Home Depot, Ace Hardware, Tractor Supply, and it'll tell you the level of your moisture. Um, so you wanna keep it about 80% moisture level. Temperature, the wigglers are most effective between 55 and 77 degrees. If it's below or above that temperature doesn't mean it's going to harm them. It just, they will not be as effective in creating worm castings for you. They will slow down. Um, if it's too hot, as we get some Florida, make sure you keep them, your worm farm in a shaded area. If it's outside, um, if it gets too hot, there's, we'll talk about it in troubleshooting how you can cool it down. And you might want to keep a thermometer uh, taped to the inside of your lid of your bin. Uh, so you can get an accurate, or actually in the, you can set it in the bedding too, to get an accurate temperature reading to make sure it's not getting too hot. I don't think we can tell by sticking our finger in if it's too hot or, or too cold, but the worms can sense it. The pH, uh, just like with most plants, they like a neutral pH between 6 uh, and 7.5. Um, that's their comfort zone. If it's over 7.0, it'll be considered more alkaline. If it's below 7.0, it's considered more acidic. Um, they prefer more of a neutral pH. And in the picture on the right, you can see something's not right with that picture. All those worms are trying to escape. First problem is the lid's off of it. So of course they're trying to escape. And there is light around it, so, but they're still trying to escape. But it's probably either too wet, too dry, too hot, too cold, or the pH is off. So those are the three things you want to uh, keep your keep uh, pay attention to. If you maintain those three things, you're going to be provided with lots and lots of worm castings from your worms. I hear you, Sophia. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, now we're gonna get into what we feed our worms. I'd already mentioned they'll eat paper, they'll eat cardboard, um, they'll eat leaves, they'll eat grasses, um, but you can also give them your leftover food scraps. You can give them your garden waste and leaves. Um, but you wanna do it when it's already starting to break down. Uh, it's, that's why some people will freeze their, their uh, kitchen waste because it, they, first of all, it allows them to build it up, but also as it uh, thaws out, it actually begins to break down. Uh, so that's one reason to freeze it. Um, but you also need to know what you can and cannot feed your worms. You can't just give your worms anything. If you feed your worms incorrectly, you're, you could cause um, an anaerobic condition with your farm and it could actually cause, I don't know if I, is it anaerobic? Let me, get, let me think about that for a minute. It can create a condition where the oxygen levels in the farm are gone and your, your, your worms will die. So you want to be careful what you feed them. You want to feed them the right items because if you don't, it can go anaerobic. Um, so what we're going to do is, is we're going to... You got it right, yeah. Joe. I wanted to let you know that. You got it. Okay, Anaero thanks. Anaerobic is lack of oxygen. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so feeding worms. What do we feed them? We talked about vets, your, your kitchen waste, which is not your meats and, and all that, it's your vegetable kitchen waste, carrots, your, your lettuce, radish leftovers, limited amounts of potatoes, you don't wanna give them a lot of potatoes, and leafy vegetables, again, like your lettuces and spinach and, and whatnot. You can give them fruit waste, don't give them citrus. Citrus will cause your farm to go acidic, and that's not what we want. You're gonna give them eggshells weekly for digestion. In the wild, what they do is they will actually eat gravel. That's what helps them digest the food. Um, coffee grounds and the filters, they love those. It's an excellent worm food, but again, with our, as, excuse me, again, as with everything else, you want to do it in moderation. Is there Cardboard. a certain, like, uh, how much do you find, how fine do you make those eggshells? Or are you just like, you crack an eggshell and whoop, toss it into your... Uh, yeah, your no. Bin. You do want to think, and you do want to grind them up to, to really small pieces. If they're too big, uh, it actually can uh, cut, cut your worms because, you know, the jagged edges of an eggshell can be sharp. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you want to grind them down to almost like a powder. And I actually don't eat a lot of eggs, so I buy my eggshells. I got them off Amazon. It's, you can actually buy ground up eggshells. But... Chickens, you know, a lot of people raise chickens. They feed them eggshells too. So it's not, you know, it's it's many, many uh, animals that people raise will use eggshells. Perfect, thank but you. But yeah, you want, you want to grind them up. Uh, cardboard, again, shredded, tree leaves in moderation, garden waste we talked about, beanstalks, pea vines, beet tops. Um, I would avoid giving them anything that is from a toxic plant, like a trumpet plant. I don't know that there's anything true about it, but there are ways that, you know, I just don't want to take the risk that when you're going to put that in the garden, it's got, you may have some toxic uh, conditions. I don't know if that's true. Why chance it? So, yeah, just don't give them anything from toxic plants. Starches like potatoes in moderation. Aged animal manure, horse and cow manure, not dog waste, not cat waste cow manure or horse manure. Um, and then they also make a worm chow. You can give them a commercial worm food. Um, that's for people that don't have a lot of kitchen waste or people that don't eat their vegetables. <laughs> um, again, do not feed citrus. Do not feed meat products, dairy waste, cooking oil or grease, human waste. I guess they had to, you had to talk about that because people have tried that or pet waste. Just what we've talked about so far. So that's that's how you feed your worms. And I don't think I need to get in too detail. Just make sure you know you chop it up fine. It doesn't have to be super fine. Um, so if it's breaking down, they'll be able to consume it. I give them, they love banana peels. Um, I give them banana peels. I give them squash, pumpkin. Uh, Halloween, I always have plenty of food for my Halloween. Like I said, that's that's how I got worms to come to my yard is I got all my neighbor's pumpkins 
chopped them all up and just spread them throughout my garden because I'm in a new subdivision. So we didn't have any worms. Well, I have a lot of worms now just from doing that. So yeah, it's a food that they like, pumpkin, banana peels. Um, you don't need to worry about adding an additional bin to a, uh, a flat single container worm farm, but for the worm, uh, vertical farm, you'll, you'll wanna add a bin once your first bin's about two thirds full of worm castings. And again, you'll be able to tell the difference between if it's worm castings and the beddings is it'll take on a really dark uh, color to it. And what you'll do is you'll want to take uh, just a small scoop from that first bin that you're going to be putting another bin on top of, spread it into a clean bin. Do not put um, a cardboard on it on the bottom like you did with your very first bin. So what you're doing is you're creating a way for your worms to crawl up the bin, up from one bin to another bin. Your vertical farms will have holes in the bottom for the worms to go uh, back and forth from. Um, regardless of the bedding from the first bin or fresh bedding, you want to add, the, add again some of this sparingly to create one inch to one and a half inches of bedding for the, the second, your, your next bin up. And again, you want to make sure the moisture level is just moist. You don't want it dripping wet. So take some of the bedding from the first bin, add some shredded paper, some garden soil, compost from your compost bin, brown leaves or brown grass. Um, and if it's not moist enough, again, add water a little at a time. If it's too moist, add more of these materials, just like you did with your first bin. Um, then you can place some food in the new bin and cover the food with the, make sure, oh, always, that's what I did mention. Whenever you feed your worms, always cover the food with a thin layer of the bedding. And I'll get into a little later why you want to do that. Um, and before you put that next bin into your, your first bin, take that paper from the top of your first bin, lay it over the top of the bedding in your new bin, and then just set your new bin into the first bin. I hope that makes sense. You're just, just gonna, it's just going to sit right on top of the bedding, uh, that second bin. It's okay if there's still food in your first bin because the worms will go back and forth between the bins. Worms tend to eat their food several times. So that you're gonna find them in the first bin and your second bin. If you get up to the third and fourth bin, you're gonna find them in all four bins. So you go back and forth. Um, but once the food is all gone in the lower bin and they've been back and forth enough times, they will migrate up to the next level. With your worm farm, patience is key. This, like I said, doesn't happen overnight. I've had mine, this current one going for nine months. I'm on my third bin. I've got two, two thirds full bins of nice worm castings. And I'm just gonna keep building it up. So when I get into the fall planting season, I have three raised beds. So it kind of works out well. One bin to each bed, I'll dump the, the um, castings into. And I'll talk about how we harvest castings also a while. Um, fat, many factors play into how fast you'll have your castings. Uh, obviously, length of the time your farm's been operational, the number of worms you started with, how often you feed your worms. Uh, again, the three things we talked about, moisture, temperature, and pH, all determine how well your worms are going to work. Um, and also the type of farm you're using. Uh, it does doesn't play a big factor in how fast you'll get worm castings, but if you use a single container, you can usually harvest sooner than you can with a vertical system. And speaking of harvesting, so now let's talk a little bit about how you're going to harvest those castings. Um, it's a little easier with a vertical farm than it is with a, I call it a horizontal farm, I, just because the other one's vertical, so I used horizontal. I don't know if that's a single, a single bin farm. Um, what you're going to do is you want to get the worms all to one side of the bin. Well, how do you get the worms all to go to one side of the bin? What you're going to do is you're only going to feed them on one half of the bin for the month before you harvest. You want to harvest your worm castings. Most of your worms will then migrate over to that half where you're feeding them. Now, when you do go to harvest your bin, you're probably going to still have some cocoons in there. You're probably going to still have some worms in your harvest. So one way to get the worms to go down into the bin is take your lid off, 
and then wait about 10 or 15 minutes. What will happen is because it's light, your worms will start burrowing deeper down into the, the, into the castings that you're going to harvest. After that 10 or 15 minutes, take a small layer of the castings out, scrape it off the top, put them in your container wherever you're going to store them, and then wait another 10 to 15 minutes. And you're going to do this continually until you get down to about the last half inch of worm castings. And what you're going to do is you're just going to leave that last half inch in your working farm. You don't want to deal with trying to get the rest of the worms out of it or trying to get the cocoons out of it. Just leave them there. And that's all there is to it. Then you're going to add more bedding to it. And you, what you want to do is you want to add enough bedding to bring the bin up, that side up to the level of the other side of the bin. It sounds counterintuitive because the goal is to get them to fill your bin up. And why, why am I filling it up to the side? Same as the other side. Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Because what you're going to do is after a month, what you're going to do is fill it all the way up so that it's level. Now you're going to start feeding them on that new bedding side for about a month. And then after that, repeat those steps I talked about. Start, take the lid off, scrape a little bit off the top of the side that the other side of your wall bin now until you get down to the last half an inch. Now, this is why you filled up the first half. Now you're just, you're not gonna add any new bedding to it. You're gonna take that bedding from that right, that first half, the very first side you harvested and created the bedding in, you're just gonna level your bin off now. So it'll bring the level down to a lower level to give them room to create more castings. Does that make sense everyone, Dr. Clem, does that? Does that make sense? Did I lose you? Everyone's still there? It makes sense, Joe. Yeah, sorry, okay. I couldn't get to my <laughs> oh, I, was I couldn't get to my mute button. <laughs> <laughs> like, am I talking to myself? <laughs> it's so quiet on your end. Um, now for the vertical worm farm, harvesting the castings is a little simpler. What you're going to do is you're going to take your very bottom bin. Let's say you got five bins stacked up now. You're going to take the very first bin you set up. You're going to move it to the top of your, of your farm, and you're going to set it in the top. And then what you're going to do is you're going to do the same thing you did with the single container. You're going to take the lid off, wait about 10, 15 minutes, scrape a little bit of layer of the worm castings off, and then wait 10 to 15 minutes, scrape a little bit more off, until you get down to about a half an inch. And that's how you do the, the worm castings for the vertical farm. You're just gonna move your first bin to the top. If you wanna harvest, if you got five bins, chances are first, second, third bins probably all have castings in them. So if you wanna harvest all three of them, you would do them all the same way. Just bring the second one to the top and then the third one until you got all the castings you want. Um, what you, what, couple things you could do is if you want you could the, the, the last half of inch of castings this is what I, I do I just add it to my to the bin right below it now the reason you put it in the top bin while you're harvesting is because you want the worms to to go down into the lower bin they're not all going to go down some may still be in that last half of castings that you leave so then I what I would do is I would just dump it into the, the bin below it and if it's not quite two thirds full, I'll just rinse out the bin I just emptied and set it aside so I'm ready to add another bin. Otherwise, if it is two thirds full after I've dumped that extra half inch into the bin below it, I will start a new bin. I will add a new bin to it, start a new bedding like we've talked about. Troubleshooting. So, so far, I just. If you had any questions, if anyone had any questions, this that's really the from beginning to end about vermicomposting, what what it is, how you can do it at home with the horizontal of uh, standard single container or vertical container, how to set the bedding up, how to monitor it, how to feed them, how to um, harvest your castings. So. That leaves just this final section of troubleshooting. If you're doing, if you're monitoring your worm farm and you're doing things properly, you probably won't have any of these problems. This is the reason 
uh, I said, though, these mites and fruit flies are, you may notice in your bin. That's the reason I mentioned you want to bury all the food under a thin layer of the bedding. What that does is it will keeps the odor away so fruit flies aren't going to come there. It also helps keep the mites down because mites are obviously the offspring of another insect that lay the eggs there. So if you, if you put your food under a thin layer of bedding, you probably won't have a mite and fruit fly, fruit fly, fruit fly problem. If you do, it indicates you've done a couple things. Either you've overfed your worms and attracted the fruit flies because there's just too much in there, or the bedding's become too wet. That's more for the mites than the fruit flies. So to resolve that, um, and ignore that where it says low pH. I, I guess I must have copied and pasted that. I have to fix that. Um, you're going you're to want to remove any of the food the mites are on or any of the food that's showing any sign of, signs of rot. Not just decay. I mean outright rotting. You want to get those foods out. You don't want food rotting in your worm bin. That's just going to cause issues with the bin. and It'll attract other critters to it. Um, and again, make sure the remaining foods covered with a thin layer of bedding. And if it was too moist, you're going to want to add some shredded paper to the to the farm. Like I said, uh, a worm farm is pretty much odorless. Uh, some is normal, but if you start to notice a really unpleasant smell, um, that's a true indicator that your farm is not functioning like it should. Um, several causes. You'll find that most of your causes of problems with your worm farm have to do with either overfeeding or too much moisture. Those are the two primary issues that are going to cause you problems with your worm farm. When you feed them, the way to tell how much food, and I didn't get into this earlier, I apologize, you want to give them, you want to put the food in the bin, and if it's not gone in two days, you've overfed them. If it's gone in a day, you've underfed them. So you're going to want to monitor it, monitor your farm for a little while to determine exactly how much food to feed your worms. Um, because if you do start overfeeding your worms, you're going to start getting an odor because they're going to, the food's going to start rotting. Another reason you may get odor is the food was not properly covered. Again, it, it, it speeds up the decomposition process. Maybe some of the food you put in your bin had some proteins in it you didn't know about. Um, we're not supposed to feed the worms any proteins, no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no greasy food. But sometimes uh, if you just scrape a plate and you think you're just getting vegetables, you might get some meat product in there or something. That can cause an odor. And again, too much moisture can also cause... Uh, cause an odor too because what you're going to you're doing is you're it's getting too thick and too heavy and it's compacting the the bedding and the, the, the castings and, and then it can go anaerobic because it gets too compact um, another is insufficient oxygen this is what i was just talking about it gets too compact and it goes anaerobic what you want to do to get the oxygen flowing again is if it's too wet obviously you're going to want to add the paper add the cardboard but if it's just a matter it's too compacted you want to every so often you want to get a you can use, use your hands you know or you can use a little rake but you're going to want to rake through your worm castings in the bedding to make sure it stays loose this creates ventilation holes in the dirt um, if it gets too compact it goes it's anaerobic and they can the, again the, the worms will drown Improper temperature. Yes, in Florida, we usually we usually deal with the too hot scenario. It becomes becomes too hot. Uh, some things you can do to cool it off is spray some cold water under the bedding or move it to a more shaded area. Um, if you're unable to cool it and the temperature exceeds 95 degrees Fahrenheit, you're going to want to spray cold water on the bedding, remove the lid to help some of the warm air escape. Um, and maybe you just even put some ice cubes in, the, in, in there also. If none of that works and after five minutes it's still pretty hot in there, you can spray more cold water on it, but then that's going to actually create too much moisture. So the best thing to do is remove the lid 
And if you're using a vertical worm farm, what you can do is, as I have in that picture there, you can crisscross your bins so that ventilation can get through to all of the bins. Because there's, as I said, there's holes in the bottom of each of these bins. So if the, the bedding is loose, you break it up and it's not compact. Uh, and by setting them up this way, it will allow the um, air to flow through freely and help cool it off. Um, if still you can't get it cooled off, you might want to just bring it inside or bring it in your garage or and then maybe put a fan on it or something. Um, final thing, too cold. I don't think that really becomes an issue here. Obviously, if it becomes too cold, you're just going to need to move it to a warmer location, um, most likely your garage. Um, so I think I've covered everything from setting up your farm, picking your worms, feeding your worms, harvesting your farm, um, and troubleshooting. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be willing to answer them. All right. Well, thanks, Joe. We have You're quite welcome. a few questions. You know, I okay. wanted to make sure that we got through um, everything um, to allow make sure you were able to present everything because we did have quite a few questions come in and we were able to answer some of them. But yeah. uh, some of them, I think, you know, just I want, I think that they'd be good to have you follow up on. Um, okay. So the first one uh, that I have was, uh, had to do with setting up the bedding. Is there okay. a preferred ratio that you use with the material uh, for that bedding? No, I just, I, I mean, you can, you can set it up with both, you can do peat moss and shredded paper, you can do, and it can be half and half, it could be two thirds and one third, there's no real set ratio. Mm -hmm. What I would do though, if you're gonna use peat moss and coconut coal, which are the two most people use to start, make sure you put some shredded newspaper or some leaves or grass in there, uh, because that is food for them. They really, they will eat the coconut coal, um, but that's that comes with time. Um, but make sure you put a mixture. Don't just put one thing in. Yeah. Put, you know, a little bit of peat moss. But you can put peat moss and coconut coal. The biggest thing to remember, though, is do not put any greens in it. If you okay. put greens in it, it, it it's going to overheat your farm. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. The next, you know, there was a couple of questions that came in that had to do with the leachate that came out from the vertical yeah. towers. Um, yeah. So I did look up some research and like, because I was curious as some of the things, because we had a couple of questions that I helped answer that, um, okay. you know, you mentioned not using it on the edibles. Um, and right. there is some information that shows that it is very high in nutrients, but to use that for like your ornamental beds right, um, right. and I, exactly what you mentioned. But one of the things that I saw was a concern was, you know, it can actually have so high of nitrogen. If you do not dilute it, you can burn your plants. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I didn't mention that. I meant to me mention that if you, yeah. Um, <laughs> you want to dilute it. Absolutely. It's super, super high. Yeah. And nitrogen. Yes. The, the leaf that is. Yes. And then, Thank how often do you drain, do you have to drain that leachate or is it just really, do you keep it open all the time and just let it slowly drain or you just like open it once a week to let it drain out? Honestly, I have never had to drain mine because I am very particular about my worm farm. And if I notice it's starting to get too wet, I will immediately start mixing dry paper, uh, shredded paper in or something. Mm -hmm. So it just depends. If you, The goal is to never have any leachate. Because what you're going to do is one thing you can do when you harvest your bin, and I didn't mention this, so it's a good thing you brought it up. You can actually make what's known as compost tea or worm tea. And what you can you do, get a, an old nylon or something that's that's breathable, and you're going to do it like a tea bag. You're going to put your worm castings in there, and then you're going to soak those worm castings in water like you would tea. And then what it does is it creates a tea from the worm castings. You're not losing losing any of the value of the worm castings. It's just giving you some, a liquid form of, of, a, of worm castings by doing that. You can do that with your regular compost too. You can make, it's called a compost tea. Take your compost, put it in a nylon or put it in a breathable bag and then soak it like you would a, a tea bag in water to drink tea. So yeah, 
Wonderful. Thank you very the much. Goal, the goal is not to, is not to have any leachate in your worm farm because it means it's been too wet and it's not desirable for your worms. So I have a two part question. Uh, okay. So how many worms do you do you start out with? Have you typically started out with um, when you're starting a new system? And what happens if you're very productive in worm production? <laughs> how, oh. do, is there too many worms you can have? No, no, no. I think I, I'm pretty sure I mentioned that the worms uh, self-regulate their colony. They, if, if it's getting too crowded, they, they won't. They, some will either die off or they won't breed. They won't have any more worms. So they dictate that population based off of they resource availability. Yeah. That's they do control their own environment. It's very interesting. Um, also, as far as what I started with, I usually start with about 500. Okay. Now you said that's a pound, I think. It's is it about a pound? pound is about right. 500 worms? Yeah. Yeah. So there was one question that came in earlier that I helped answer. It was like someone was said that they're buying red wigglers online uh, through an online retailer, and one of the disclaimers mentioned that uh, there were that it said there might be some uh, blues. I know. Yep. 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 So that just to clarify, that's just another composting worm, just called an Indian blue. Do they do well in Florida? So is that something they need to concern I'm themselves some, with? Honestly, I'll have to get back with you. And I haven't the, the the ones that I've mainly dealt with and have been that we talk about are the three I talked about. I do have a gal that uh, if anyone's interested in Facebook, join. Make sure if you're interested, join. Find uh, firma composting sites uh, groups on Facebook too. But the three, those three were the ones we mainly talked about. But she, there's a, a site. Am I allowed to mention different Facebook groups? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Okay. It's called Worms Gone Wild. <laughs> and <laughs> there's a lady on there, very knowledgeable. She has lots of files. Um, you could really spend days reading her, read her own. She, she just loves her worms. And she, she raises them as pets more so than I think for worm castings. Um, she just really loves it and it's just a passion of hers and, and she can tell you just about anything about worms from what's a good worm here to what's a better worm in Alabama or in, in Texas. Oh, cool. Um, and her name is Cindy Lynn Carter and I know she would not mind if I gave her name out <laughs> um, at all because she just, it, it's just a big, she's got over 20,000 I think on her site now. Oh, wow. Yeah. And here's here's actually a really neat uh, publication I'm going to put in the chat box. It's just like a link. I'm going to send this out with all the resources, but it's from our entomology department. It's just talking about like the common earthworms and the morphology right. of them, kind of a lot what Joe mentioned, but it's kind of a neat little resource. And it talks about like the, the red wigglers and the European <laughs> nightcrawlers. Um, some questions that also popped up where when you are removing the castings, uh, do you pull any of the cocoons or the eggs out and put them back in or are you just blah? Do you, do you no, no, I try, I try to look for them. I do try to look for them. That's why it's a slow and tedious process. Um, this, some people may find this odd, but I, I, I won't kill anything. I don't like to kill anything. Insects, cockroaches, even cockroaches. Someone said cockroaches too. I said, yeah, anything. It just really hurts my heart to, to see anything die for no reason. So I'm very, even when I clean my bins out, I'm like, the babies are so tiny. So you have to really look close for them. That's why the bins are green. Part of the reason the bins are green is so the color them. of the worm sets off, is, is a nice set off for it. But yeah, I will do all in my power to make sure I save the living thing in those castings. Wonderful. Um, it just it just hurts my heart to, to kill anything needlessly. So the, even my dog, I mean, we have invasive anoles here. You know the brown anoles. <laughs> oh, the brown dog. ones. Yeah. My dog probably caught and killed three or four of them recently, <laughs> and it's like they're doing what they know, but it still upsets me. Yeah. The 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 worm castings. You, you know, I know you mentioned that you'll do that. You'll you can use them right away in the garden. You can make a tea out of them. Um, how do you? Do you store the castings, or do you just go ahead and use them right away? And if you store them, what would you what what would you recommend to trying to make sure you preserve them so you can use them later? You can store them in a in a bag. You can a lot of people put them in um, like uh, the big those plastic bags you get from the store. 
Uh, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to lose any nutrients. Um, you can put them in a Ziploc bag if you want, if you're really concerned about it and get all the air out of it. Um, but I usually will do it right at the beginning of a, of a growing season. And if I don't have enough, what I'll do is I'll supplement it with maybe some of that, um, the cow manure compost that you see it in the yellow bag. Mm -hmm. I'll sometimes supplement it or I'll buy, I will buy worm castings. I don't want to run two or three farms. Um, it just depends how much you really want in worm castings. My farm's working well enough where I pretty much have enough each growing season. Mm -hmm. Do you um, need to... It did make a big difference this year. I mean, I'm, I'm pulling tomato. I, I can grow tomatoes. I can grow anything, Dr. Clem. Oh, nice. <laughs> I'm growing lots. You can grow tomatoes. tomatoes. You got it. <laughs> and large, large zucchini and large cucumbers. So, um, aeration. Uh, um, do you aerate every time that you're feeding? I don't. I don't. Okay. I, I, I can usually tell if it's getting too compact, mm. and then I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll. I have one of those uh, little garden rakes, a little hand rake. And I just oh, and uh, guess... got the little three little prongs on it. I just pull that through it a couple times and it, it works well. Wonderful. Um, some people, rather than putting paper on top of it, they like to put um, like a potato sack type fabric on it. Yeah. I don't know what that fabric's called exactly because the worms tend to like that and they'll, they'll actually lay their eggs, their cocoons. They'll leave their cocoons on those. Yeah. Um, but sometimes the, the cocoons will be as black as the, the worm casting. So you just kind of have to, to watch and look. And you, know. you would add, you would add, if it seems too moist, you mentioned that you would just add a little bit more paper or cardboard to it. That's, Is that what you that's mentioned? That's exactly what I do. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Cause it's a food form too. So I'm, I'm also giving them food. Wonderful. I have, a shred, I bought a shredder when I got my worm farm that has also shreds cardboard up to a certain thickness up to like 15 sheets of paper thickness. Mm. So mm -hmm. I can shred my cardboard too. And I also I make sure I have, get all the, tape and everything off of it but yeah burlap that's the burlap. Thank you. That's what it is. Burlap. thank you i they was like burlap. jute fabric that's what i was thinking in my head and i know that that was not right but burlap <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah but, and like i said and, and another one i just like to you know if there's i'm just i don't know if there's more questions but i do want to talk about just real quick um there are a lot of insects out there that are great for composting I raise mealworms also. I also raise black soldier fly larvae. I feed their waste, my black soldier fly larvae waste, to my worms. So that's another manure or another poop, if you will, that you can <laughs> feed to your worms that they'll eat and they'll, they'll create a, a, a super high uh, nutrient casting. Um, um, sorry, we, have a, we saw a bunch of questions coming in, Joe. So we are getting low on time. Good. So we'll, That's we'll good. That's awesome. Because I know Christy is going to have you come back and talk about some other of those uh, yep. compost, composting specialists. Um, Absolutely. So real quick, yes, no. Um, are melons okay to include? So, I mean, it's watermelon yeah. season, so it's it, that's a good yeah. one. Yeah, they're just like, like pumpkin squash, any squash, any melons, um, what, banana peels, bananas if they get too – bananas even if they get too ripe. That's not really considered a citrus for the worms. Yeah. What about um, the, um, what about any fish? No, no, that's no a fish. No, 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 nothing but except uh, think of a vegan. That's what you feed them. <laughs> vegan food. Fair enough. That's a good way to remember it. Um, so let's see. Unlike the other ones I'm going to talk about, you can feed the other stuff too. Oh, <laughs> uh, with like the the yeah. The BSFLs, the black soldier fly larvae, I feed them. You can feed them anything. So what do you do um, if you have snails? Do you have to like reset everything or do you just kind of just put a trap in and try to get all the snails out? Snails? I've never had snails. All right, fair enough. Someone just mentioned so that someone they got... Had, I'm just curious, has someone, someone had snails before? Yeah, someone mentioned that they got some worms locally, and they had some, and they noticed some snails with it. That's um, what, yeah, that's a farmer. That's that's that sounds like, you know, what that sounds like it sounds like someone's uh, just they're probably got, they probably got regular night crawlers. What they got, and they probably just came out of someone's garden. <laughs> There's people out there that on Etsy, 
they'll sell things on Etsy and eBay um, that they don't have a lot of, but they'll, they'll just harvest them out of their yard and sell them as if they're a breeder. So you have to be very careful. Unless they're an actual business, don't buy worms from, from anyone. From but a source. Business. Yeah, because I think, you know, at the end of the day, it might be problematic if you have a lot of worms in your vermicompost. So if yeah. you cannot eradicate them, it may be snails, worth starting over. Yeah, snails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would have to tend to agree with that. They're, they're, they're very, they're not a good. Yeah, I don't, I'm not a fan of snails. I won't kill them though. Yeah, we had a we had a question that came in a little earlier, and I kind of answered it. It's like one person was like, you know, I have a lot that I create for compost. You know, should I do compost or should I do vermicomposting? My, you know, one of the strategies I want to get your oh, thought on yeah. this, Joe, is would it be something like say you're creating a bunch? I would say go ahead and do compost if you're creating a lot of yard waste. And I do can, both. And yeah. you can always just vermicompost for the fact that you want to create those worm castings. Right. But you can, if you want to help speed up that process of composting, you could include worms into your compost pile. Yes. You know, but you're just not going to be Na harvesting. Native, native worms, of course. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what happened with my compost. I have one. I did not know worms climbed, but they must. Because I have worms, I have a, one of those tumbler compost bins, and it's on a metal stand. Mm -hmm. I know I've never put nothing from my garden in there. I've only put like, because I started with just kitchen waste in my own garden for my house before I got involved with vermicomposting. I have worms in there now. Where did they come from? They had to have climbed up the, up the thing. Um, worms do climb, so mm -hmm. you know they climb. They climb the side of my of a bin. I'll find them on the lid sometimes. They're not trying to escape. They'll just they just crawl around. So, yeah, I would do that. I would I would uh, do regular composting, use native worms. But chances are, if you do it on the ground, you'll get native worms anyway. Yeah. If you do it in a bin, it's storming pretty bad here. I, I power yeah. just flickered. Um, I don't think I think we're okay. Um, but use, again, native worms. It's, it'd be cruel to introduce red wigglers into the ground here. They wouldn't survive um, because it, it just gets too, too, too hot. Too hot for them. Um, so this is a, say you do everything perfectly. You got your one pound, 500 worms, and you're starting to vermicompost. P moisture, pH temps are all ideal. After about six months, if you had to guesstimate, about what can you anticipate as a worm casting product? If you're doing a vertical farm, probably about two, two full, two two third fulls bins of, of the similar type that I showed. Um, That's pretty good. Because, like I said, when I was doing the presentation, if you're using a vertical farm, it's a slower process because of the self. The, the self-regulation the worms have on their colony size. Mm -hmm. If you're using a bigger bin, that 500 could probably become 2,000, 4,000, <laughs> and it would go up much quicker because it's just a bigger area. So surface area is it really surface and, and depth is a really big deal space, with yeah. composting. Um, then the last one is how do you like say you're done? How do you walk away from a vermicompost? convince a neighbor to do, take it <laughs> so try to sell your worms yeah don't yeah. don't yeah it sounds like we don't want to do the python it's not like the pythons and all that but what you're doing is you're you're introducing a worm that's not native here if somehow they do survive which i've been told i've been told i've never released them i've been told they will not survive in a garden here in florida that's what i my research has told me um but if they were, I mean, now you're introducing a non-native into the environment. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be introducing non-natives, anything into the environment. We have enough with them coming in on boats and, and airplanes and everything else. Um, Here, um, yeah. What do you do, like, when you have the horizontal bins, mm -hmm. how do you know when it's, like, the best time to harvest those? Can you go over that it's again? A, it's a judgment call. It just depends on how full it is. If it's 
half full, you could harvest them if you want, unless you want to, you know, to me, I would just let it go till it's at least two thirds full yeah. before I, I harvested it, even in a, a single container system. Wonderful. Um, yeah. And I know Colin has a question. Hey, Colin. <laughs> Hi, great presentation, Joe. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, I, I have a when I was sitting here thinking as you talked about the worms eating uh, these materials. Do you know actually how they digest it? Because most of it's cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, etc., plant plant material. Yeah, uh, the I wonder if the worms have a cellulase or if it's the intestinal, uh, the bacteria you mentioned in the intestine. Yeah, it's the microorganisms within the worms, but also oh. it's important, the eggshells. The eggshells help break down the food and help them digest it. I that usually get my worms eggshells about once a week. Um, oh, and you know what, speaking of that, another thing that I did not include, this, I did not update it, Dr. Flynn, is if you notice your worms are getting smaller or you have fewer worms, that's a troubleshooting issue also. You're probably way underfeeding them. Mm, that makes sense. They will regulate their size as well as they will their colony. Mm. They'll get smaller based on the amount or bigger based on the amount of food that they're eating. Wonderful. So that's another troubleshooting point I did not add in. I need to add into my, my presentation. But yeah, Colin, the, the, the microorganisms within the earth in the worm's body plus the eggshells is help would help break everything down. Great. And what I did, I wanted to make sure I let everyone know is I put because we are we're almost 530, but I did put the follow up survey in the chat box. Um, and again, okay. what we'll do is we'll send out an email that has a copy of the presentation like the recording it'll be on our youtube channel um as well as we'll include a copy of joe's presentation um and you know this this monthly master garden volunteer series uh this lecture series runs throughout most of the year and this is actually our last program until we kind of go on our that the summer break for that lecture series program um and we'll kick back off in September. Am I right, Christy? Or am I just late August? Late August. There we the go. Third Thursday or third Tuesday of August, we will reconvene. So um, but in the meantime, I did put in a chat box earlier as well. Um we'll we still have all of our other programs that are happening at the county extension office. So feel free to um see what's coming up throughout the summer um we'll be doing a lot of webinars just like we have been it just won't be the lecture series because you know we let the master gardeners take a break for a little bit <laughs> um, real quick dr clem um that presentation i'm going to update it before you send it out i'd like to add some updates to it absolutely based on today's presentation absolutely yeah absolutely yeah. um so i do want to thank joe um for putting together this presentation it was very informative and i mean a lot of great questions throughout and i know that this is something that we've had a lot of feedback on in the past like oh this would be a great program and you know this is perfect for you and thank you very much and i want to thank everybody for joining us today yeah and thank you too for all the good questions because it's this is always a learning process for me too i'm i'm continually learning about the composting yeah with the worms It'll help me improve my, my future presentation. So thank you.